This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a multi-award winning actor, writer, producer, and director who first captured our hearts as DJ Connor on the long-running TV sitcom Roseanne and its spin-off series The Connors, winning a TV Land Award, a Young Artist Award, and a Young Star Award nomination. He's also appeared in a number of other TV shows, including Seinfeld, Walker, Texas Ranger, and most recently in the TV movie Abducted by My Teacher, The Elizabeth Thomas Story. He also wrote and produced many episodes of Roseanne Barr's talk show, The Roseanne Show, and he created, wrote, produced, and directed numerous episodes of the TV show Fish's Call Sheet. He's also directed multiple projects, including five episodes of The Connors. In addition, he's produced feature films, including A Place in the Field, and Available, A Modern Day Fairy Tale, which won the Best Romantic Comedy Award at the Indie Gathering International Film Festival. He also produced four episodes of the 2015 TV miniseries, Halsnoy. His passion as a producer and director is to tell relatable, visceral, and uplifting stories that feature complex and varied characters and that celebrate our diversity and inclusivity as a community. Our guest is a true Renaissance man. In addition to being an actor, writer, producer, and director, he's also been an athlete, coach, teacher, bounty hunter, and rescue diver. I'm delighted to welcome Michael Fishman to our show. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Harvey, that was quite an intro. Uh, you know, you have these moments in your life where you're like, man, I got to get moving. I got to get doing stuff. And then somebody reads all that and I start going, OK, I'm doing OK. You are doing OK. And the thing about you, Michael, is that you grew up right before our eyes, starting from the age of six and for 10 seasons on Roseanne. Did you ever feel like you missed out on having a regular childhood? Well, I didn't have a regular childhood. I think that we can all agree on. I never felt like I missed out. I, I still played sports. I went to public school on the days and weeks I didn't work. So I was always in my community and I always had people my age around me. I actually think I got more out of it. I had this beautiful gift of having a regular teacher at school, but having a set teacher at work who really guided me and expanded my education. And after all these years, you know, 36 plus years, I still love this business. And I think it's been such a gift in my life. Well, that's for sure. And you are a gift in our lives. Now, we've had a lot of former child actors on our show. Billy Moomy, Angela Cartwright, Butch Patrick, Kathy Garver, Marie Osmond. Most recently, we had Todd Bridges. And they all talked about the challenges and pressures they faced, not only working full time, but growing up in the public spotlight and being so famous. Was that difficult for you? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a very different life. And I think a lot of it is what you make out of it. It can be a real challenge. It can really warp your sense of identity. There's this beautiful thing when we do this business right. You're surrounded by 200 or 300 really creative people. But creative people have their own demons and creative people uh, have a different way of looking at things. And sometimes they're not as patient or not as understanding. And sometimes they're overly understanding and overly emotional. So it creates kind of this very deep world for you to be living in and kind of a deep pool of water to be swimming in at a young age. I think it's how you perceive it. For me, I, I always try to find the good in people. I still am. And I love what we do. So I can't really imagine my life being any other way. I've heard you say, Michael, in other interviews, when people ask you about the emotional toll of being famous, You've said that if you're not enough without it, then you will never be enough with it, which is so profound in terms of what people expect to get out of being famous. What do you think it was about your emotional makeup that has kept you grounded and stable and centered all these years when so many other celebrities just couldn't keep it all together? Well, first, I, I don't claim to have always kept it together. I think that's one of the things of being really honest. I love that you use that quote because that's really what I raised my kids with is if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. And I think you get to choose the it. Everybody chooses their own it in their life. Fame is a magnifying glass, just like I think money is a magnifying glass. If you're a kind person, you're going to do bigger, kinder things because you have more access. If you're 
hurt person, you're probably going to hurt more people. If you're a really negative person, you're going to go out and be destructive with it. And I don't know. I've always looked at it this way. I embraced this opportunity. Fame is hard, comes with a lot of responsibility. I've never had an anonymous life. I've never had a time where what I did wasn't going to have bigger consequences or I wasn't going to be held accountable at the highest level. But there's a part of that that probably is good. And I think maybe I got a preview of what a lot of young people are dealing with now because my life is a bit like social media has created for other people where you think you have access to the world. And if you do something, the world can see it in a moment. My life was always that. You know, that's a very interesting perspective. I never thought of that, but you were living social media long before it was ever invented. Yeah, and in the best and the worst ways. We were huge and the show was so impactful, but also, you know, the National Anthem incident and death threats and bomb scares and people having large opinions about you and your life and without even knowing you. And for me, I think I just decided to embrace that and realize the good of it and try to see what I could do from it from a positive standpoint. Last month, we had one of the writers from Roseanne on the show, Stan Zimmerman. Oh, yeah. He said that the atmosphere on the set for the writers was extremely tense because the writers were constantly being fired and replaced by Roseanne and Tom Arnold. Did you ever experience any of that tension on the set? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was everywhere and and you couldn't not know. We were the most I try to explain to people the stories from our set are still legendary, both good and bad. And what I would say is we were the most in some ways, the most professional and efficient show. And at the same time, we were kind of a little carnival and just chaos. And, you know, we kind of blew into town and and shook things up and made a mess and then kind of were off to the next thing. You know, Stan's a good example. You know, he lived through a period of time on our show that was really tough. I think he was number 13, you know, back in those days. I don't know if he talked about wearing his shirt and things like that. And I, you know, when you're small but aware This isn't just part of your world. It's your whole world. And you're trying to figure out what the world is. So in my case, I was taking everything in. And like I said before, I've tried really hard to look at the things that I really like or love about people and take the best of them and then be honest and, you know, acknowledge the things that I I don't want to carry forward. You grew up around comedians and I'm sure you would agree with me that very often great comedy comes from a place of pain. And sometimes there are mental health issues that play into that. And I think we certainly saw that with Roseanne. And it just makes me so sad, Michael, because we live in a very unforgiving society, don't you think? Well, what I'll say is, you know, comedy, I grew up around comedy. So comedy is this beautiful place where nothing is taboo and nothing is off limits, in a sense. Because they're some of the smartest people in the entire world, and they look at the world different, and they're not afraid to say it. We're in a place where people feel like we've come to a place where we're too sensitive. There's a part of me that hears that, but there's also a part of me that goes, maybe we weren't sensitive enough for a long time. And if you've been marginalized, if you've been pushed out, then you probably feel like it's about time we hurt people. But we are very close-minded and unforgiving at times with comedians or people who make mistakes. And what I would tell you is it's really sad the way we're kind of become all or nothing. Because the truth is we're all flawed. We all make mistakes. And if we don't give people room to learn from their mistakes, then it's really hard to grow. And it's a really hard, it's a hard tightrope walk to walk. And I think going back to the fame question you asked me earlier, it's one of the things I think that really has people unravel who get fame or press. What do you think a celebrity's responsibility is when it comes to expressing political opinions? Well, I think, we have a right to share anything. And I I believe that we should share our opinions in our world. I don't think we should push our political views or agendas on people. It's just not my style. I think that I actually like when people disagree with me because I can learn a lot more. And I'm always fascinated. We've come to a place where really honestly, politically, we have a hard time listening to each other. There's two sides in, in this country in particular so far apart, but around the world, politically, we've become an all or nothing kind of humanity as a whole. And the truth is, I need somebody else's ideas, even if I disagree with them, to help me balance either to make my ideas more concrete 
or to show me where I may be missing something or I may not have a perspective that I need to listen to. And it's hard. Politics are difficult. And, in, you know, when you share yours, people are going to have a reaction. I think part of it is I, I was raised by a bunch of people who said what they wanted to say and were honest about what they said. And, you know, Roseanne is one of the first people that I learned from is I speak up. People don't always like it. Sometimes I may not even say things perfectly or I may over time, my opinions evolve. And I hope everybody's opinions are evolving because I don't want to have an idea and be closed off to the world forever because of Well, the thing that comes through about you, Michael, is your compassion. You're a very compassionate guy. And you mentioned Roseanne. I know you've loved Roseanne your whole life. There's no question she's a brilliant writer and producer. Have you found a way to forgive her? Harvey, I've loved her my whole life and I love her right now as I sit here. I will always love Roseanne. I will always care for her. She will always be someone that there's so many parts of her I admire. I also am incredibly sad. You talk about compassion is I don't think I fully grasped the level of some of the mental health stuff she was fighting because I watched her fight for so many years and I watched her go through so many things. To me, in some ways, you know, she, she was so heroic in a lot of ways that she was almost bigger than bigger than some of her own frailties. And what I'll tell you is I've, I've always loved her. I Even the day that the tweets came out, I was the one person who actually was completely open and honest on both sides. I did not agree with what she said. But I also, if you go back to that same season right before, if you go to the Go Cubs episode, if you see something, say something, that's what I was raised with. That's what she's told the world. And we saw her say something that was inappropriate. And she herself says she wished she hadn't said it and that she felt was inappropriate. But I, I think this is a more complex issue that I think sometimes people forget, which is we've all loved people who have said and done things that we don't agree with and that we don't condone. We're not OK with the action. But that doesn't mean you forget or stop loving the human being and that you don't understand that they can make mistakes and that you don't want to see them flourish. She's brilliant. Probably one of the most brilliant producers to ever exist. Certainly one of the top comics to ever exist. As far as a creative mind, I'm in awe of her every day, and she has inspired so much of the work that I want to put out in the world. I spent most of my life defending her at every you know, intersection and against every threat from going on tour after the National Anthem Incident in 1990 and, and fighting for the show 20 years afterwards, doing stuff and coming in to help her build things when no one else would stand beside her to fighting and standing with her when we first came back as a show and saying that she would never say anything that was racist or offensive. I found the comments to be completely inappropriate. And, but I also said that very same day, this is out of character for the woman that I've known my whole life. I said it to the entire world. And I said, I've never seen these things before. Now there were some other tweets that were problematic. There were some other comments that are problematic. I think she has, not the best team around her. People who have not encouraged or supported the mental health. I think there are people who take advantage of the fact that sometimes she misspeaks, but it, it gets attention and it makes them money. And I think people have capitalized on it. It's really sad. Well, I don't know how much you know about me, Michael, but I spent 26 years as a criminal and family court judge, and I saw many, many people who were good people who made mistakes, errors of judgment a mistaken thinking, a spontaneous utterance. And I was in the business of giving people a second chance. And I feel very badly that in your industry, people don't get a second chance. And it seems to me to be very unforgiving. Now, one thing about you, I heard you say once in an interview that your loyalty as a human being was built out of being betrayed. Your aunt sued you when you were six years old, for heaven's sakes. Tell me about some of the betrayals in your life and how you've dealt with them. Well, let me touch on the first thing you said. You know, as a former judge, yeah, you did give people second chances. You also had to hold people accountable based on the law and the responsibility. And that's, it's a hard thing. I do think our business gives people second chances. And I think there's opportunities. You build your second chance, though, I think very much. And 
there are people in my life that I would love to help build other chances if they're willing and want to. So let me start there. The other part is, yeah, you really did your research, Harvey, which I knew you always do. You know, yeah, my aunt sued me at six years old. Fame came with a price. And, and what I will say is the truth is those people actually were showing you who they were the whole time. And I think that's an important part is no one gets through life unscathed. My life's been relatively easy in comparison, I think, to a lot of other people. That doesn't mean I haven't had betrayal or trauma. You know, if you want specific betrayals, I mean, that list is too long. What I've done is I, I've been very conscious of I'm kind because I know what cruel is. I'm loyal because I know what betrayal is. And I try really hard to make sure I'm very clear with my actions and my behaviors. Well, a lot of people may be surprised to learn that you never got rich from being on Roseanne. And I read that at one point in your life, a few months after Roseanne ended at the age of 15, you were homeless. Is that right? Uh, yeah, almost 16. Yeah. It's a complex thing. You know, the one thing about the show is you make money and it's a lot more money than you would make in most jobs, but it's not, most people don't make get rich money and especially as a kid. And so you know, between that and, you know, my dad and I kind of, we butted heads. My dad's an immigrant. He's an old school guy. It's kind of my way or the highway. And, you know, there were a few times we kind of pushed each other. And after the show, I was in a horrible place. If you can imagine, you know, the best way I can equate is if you imagine like, you know, moving to a brand new town and having everything in your life stripped away, but multiply that by about 10,000, you know, here my whole world was working on this show and working every day and loving what I did and overnight it ends and everyone disappears and is scattered in a thousand different directions. And this was pre cell phone pre, you know, back in those days I had a pager. Yeah. And you know, there were two times in my life where I ended up without anywhere to be and anything, you know, my life was reduced to a backpack and uh, those times really shaped me. And what I will tell you is I both found my character of who I want to be in those moments and I realized what matters and I stopped caring about possessions and things and it, it made me a much deeper human being. It made me grow up even faster and it made me value family in a special way. Well, you wouldn't have any reason to know this, but when I told my parents I was gay when I was 19, back in 1975, they threw me out and I was homeless. So mm -hmm. Believe me, I understand something of what you went through. And isn't it great that we could gain strength from those hardships and that our past doesn't define us? I agree, Harvey. And what I'll say to you is, if I could go back and hug that 19-year-old you and tell you this is where you're going to end up and that the future is bright, you probably wouldn't have believed me, but you probably could have used that hug in that moment. And what I'll tell you is, for me, there are these crushing moments where you're all alone. But it also is a great opportunity for you to find yourself. Wow, that's so true. And I wish I could have gone back and hugged the 15-year-old Michael because I would have brought you home and I would have <laughs> made, made you chicken soup and I would have paid for that pager and helped you rebuild yourself to the person you are. But you didn't need my help. I wonder, did you have any hesitation about returning to the role of DJ in 2018? Uh, yeah, a lot. Roseanne and I had talked about it for years and years and years. So a lot of the ideas that came out when the new show came were things we had discussed for years and years. But it's hard to go back to a character like that. And in particular, in my case, you know, you try to build a, away from that. But if you get that group of people together and someone says, do you want to work with this group of people? Do you want to work with Roseanne and John Goodman and Laurie Metcalf and like... Do you want to work with absolute talent legends and powerhouses? And when we came back, people didn't even see all the people behind the scenes, like Whitney Cummings and Wanda Sykes. And like we had a who's who of writers, producers, creative minds. It, it, there's no way to say no to that because the special part about the show Roseanne, and, and it kind of leads into the things I want to build myself, is it's a show that tackles real life topics. And touches really deep issues, but uses humor and comedy to kind of connect people and bring people together. You don't get to do that enough in any business. And I, I think it was so powerful. It was an absolute yes. It, you know, but again, <laughs> you know, 
not everybody wanted me back in the building. And, you know, I, you know, I certainly didn't get rich in that experience either. You know, financially, I got rich emotionally and personally, but there was a lot of chaos going on in my life. And I got paid the same thing I did in 1988 as a, as a seven year old, you know, and I took it because I bet on me. And I think that's a lesson that people should learn is don't do things for the money. Do things because you love them. Yes. Do what you love. Don't chase the money. The money will chase you if you do what you love. So how did you feel about not being invited to return to the Connors for season five? Oof. Heart, it's a heartbreaking thing, but it's an understandable thing. I mean, they'd gone in a different direction. Every member of DJ's family has been slowly jettisoned off the show. I had been used in less and less episodes because they just kind of geared towards other characters. I think for me, the hardest part is I love that show. There's a legacy there that I came back to help rebuild after it fell apart because I felt like we owed something to the fans and we owed something to the show that had died so kind of unceremoniously. I also felt compelled and have always felt compelled to tell stories about interracial families and about diverse families and military stories. These are really, you know, central cores and themes in my life. And I was really excited because DJ has, to me, one of the most compelling stories, having been judgmental and having been biased and shown prejudice and then ending up marrying the same girl. And she literally changes his whole life and his world perspective. I think that is a story. And I, I kept advocating. I feel like that's a story that the world needs to bring people together. And we were in a unique place to do it. So I wish we had. And then I come from a military family. Military families are struggling. They estimate at least 22, you know, service members pass away every day by their own hand. People are really struggling, and I have been closely connected to the military, and I, I don't think we do a great job of encapsulating what that experience is like and, and supporting them properly through film and media. So those are both kind of my personal missions. Yeah, I think it was time, and I think it's great that you are pursuing the passions and the creativity in the areas of society that you want to illuminate and use your artistry as a way of bringing us all together and bringing more compassion, more understanding. Now you played the role of the predatory school teacher, Ted Cummins in the TV movie about the abduction of Elizabeth Thomas. That was a very intense role and you were portraying a real person. How did you prepare for that role? Yeah, you know, by saying no first, really, to be honest with you, initially, I was really like not interested in particular. And the more I started looking at it and the more I started thinking about it, we're not talking enough, particularly with young people. I've worked with young people for the last 25 years. I was a high school coach and, you know, I, I have two daughters and I, you know, this movie came around and I started looking at this concept of grooming, which I think with the Internet and social media is be, is a growing problem and, and just it kind of epidemic. <clears throat> and then we had Elizabeth Smart, who was a producer. So you have somebody you know has background and is actively doing things in the world to make things better than what she experienced. That was a really interesting thing for me. And then I met with Sean Linden, the director, and we started talking about there were some scenes, we adjusted some scenes and, and took some stuff out because they were kind of unnecessary. And then I literally before i said yes i sent it to my daughters and said what do you think what because you're gonna have to live out in the world after i do this part what are your thoughts and my youngest daughter said something really brilliant to me which she said you know this is a chance to do something undifferent that's so different than everything else you've ever done but it's also an opportunity for you to bring some humanity and have the conversation afterwards and i said yeah and she said and the one nice thing about having it be a real person is when people look it up, they're gonna, they're not going to be convinced it's you in real life, which happens sometimes with characters. So there were a lot of things about it. It was a really challenging shoot. It was really rapid because we raced to beat it before the strike happened. And so, man, uh, I would tell you, Harvey, when you get a script and you have to say things that would never come out of your own mouth, and you have to look at someone and say them with you know, some integrity and authenticity to it. 
And he's such a manipulative character, right? I'm such a protector by nature to flip and do that. And, and I remember a few times <laughs> we had beautiful crew members who would come up to me and say, are you okay? And I would say, I will be in about 30 minutes scene. But the fact that I'm not okay probably is the best example of who I am. And I'm okay with the fact I'm going to sit in this discomfort. It's a great challenge. I mean, you know, as an actor, you sign up to do things that you would never do in any other aspect of your life and to explore parts of human nature. Someone has to play the bad guy so that the good guy's story can be told. And, you know, I feel pretty good about how that kind of worked out. I feel pretty bold. There were, there were a lot of bold moments. And if you're looking for something in life, being bold is a great place to start. It is. And I think it was a brilliant decision to cast you in that role. I'm glad I asked you that question because I think it, that performance really demonstrated a texture and a an intensity that we never got to see before. So kudos to you. I want to ask you about Michael Fishman, the writer, director, and producer. You were well known as a child on the set of Roseanne for being curious and inquisitive about every aspect of the production and everybody's jobs. When did you know that you wanted to be more than an actor and start writing, directing, and producing? I've pretty much always known, but the people I worked with didn't exactly want me to do that. They all wanted me to go off and get normal jobs. You know, I, I'm probably the only actor who grew up on a set surrounded by creative people who everybody's like, no, no, go be a doctor, be, be a veterinarian, be something, you know, normal. Uh, get out of this craziness because you're too smart. And on the original show, I pitched a bunch of episodes and actually several of them got made. I wrote parts and pieces of things that ended up in episodes. I never got credit because, again, in those days, everybody's like, you don't need that. You know, you're you're 12, 11. You know, you don't you don't need that. In hindsight, you do when you're trying to sell stuff later. What I would tell you is I've loved this business my whole life. And I think there's a beauty in Michael, the actor has a certain limited window, right? There's only certain roles I can play. And the director has the ability to create an environment for everyone. But the writer and the producer can create anything out of everything. And I can tell any story I want and dive into areas of the world that I think haven't really been represented properly. I'm surprised that the people you worked with as a kid so misjudged you. They didn't get that you weren't just a cute kid who was doing this for fun and who was then going to go off to school and be a doctor. They didn't get that you already had this passion. It's quite amazing. Now, you directed five episodes of The Connors. What was it like directing your fellow cast members? Yeah, I'm going to, Harvey, I'm going to step back for just one second. Everybody knew how smart I was. I mean, I, I got into veterinary school. I, I That was something I actually could have done and done well. And I think this is important for people to hear. The people I worked with, it's not that they didn't see me. It's that they didn't want me to feel the pain of what it is to be an artist. And I think sometimes people who love you sometimes steer you away from your dreams and, and are impediments, not because they don't see the good in you or not, because a lot of times it's because they suffered on their journey or never achieved theirs, and they don't want to watch you suffer. So I, I hope people, especially creative people, your mom, your dad, your loved one, who may be telling you do something more normal, they want you safe and secure. It comes from a lot of times, it comes from a, a beautiful place. So you, you don't have to carry all of that burden. Well, I think they wanted to protect you because they knew what a brutal industry this is, but they misjudged you in my opinion, because they didn't see your resilience, that you could handle that. You actually have such a passion for this industry, for this work, that you're resilient enough to deal with all of those heartaches. You've proven it. Yeah, and I was the whole time. If people realized I did the majority of the press for all those years on the show, it was a beautiful transition, going back to your question about coming back and directing my castmates. I think the beauty in coming back and directing my castmates was that was going to be the hardest set I was ever going to be on because some part of them still sees the six-year-old that they met. And so, you know, it's like trying to direct your dad and your uncle and like your aunt and like your siblings. There's an element where 
the communication has to be very specific. And you have to be very good at what you do because everybody's looking at you, assuming that they know you, going back to what you just said. And I do think people in some ways underestimated me, but that's my job is to surprise people. I try to underpromise and overproduce. And as a director, I feel really comfortable as a director. My job is to create an environment for people to do the best work. And I, it's like coaching. I love it. On the show, you know, being on the Connors, I would have loved an opportunity to direct Roseanne. I have a regret in that. But I also would tell you, like on the Connors, that was an environment where you're walking into a room full of legends who are used to you being their peer, right? And now you have to lead. But one of the beauties is I'm such a student. Like, you know, there were times I said to Lori, like, you know, in the old days, we used to do this and we've gotten away from that. You want to try that? Or somebody would say this line's not working. I'm like, okay, well, the pacing of this, or we used to use this word, you know, that's the beauty of having been around this. And then the technical side is, man, I love what we do from a technical standpoint. And I love crew members. They're, they're my friends. They've always been and they're guiding lights. So knowing enough to be able to be supportive and put up a framework, but smart enough to let them do their work and trust their own artistry. You strike me as the kind of director that you would have liked to work with as an actor. I, I try to be the director that people feel comfortable with to work in and to be bold and daring. I would say for me, it's a fine line because you have to know how to lead and know how to manage the clock, but you got to get everything by the end of the day. So you have to know when to push and when to let other people. And it's a beautiful environment. I said this before, and I believe it is, you know, this business is beautiful when we do it right. It's a bunch of creative, collaborative people building magic together. You're building a world to share with the world. If I do it right as a director, I can empower people. And it's fun to watch people do things and go, wow, that was amazing. And you're like, yeah, there it is, right? Like that's the moment. And the magic moment, you can feel it. Do you like directing as much as you like acting? It sounds like you like it more. Oh, no, I love acting. Uh, you know, I, I think directing is amazing because I love being a teammate. And I, 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 it's 20, 30 years of coaching. You know, it, it's about leading people and putting people in the opportunity to do something amazing. Yeah, I think as an actor, the most amazing thing in the world is to get to inhabit these characters. I love acting. I, I've never really gotten a full opportunity to talk about it. We're always talking about all the elements around it or around work. Man, I think my best work's in front of me. And a lot of it, I think, is going to be far more dramatic than it is going to be funny. Because I think it is my nature to have seen tough things in life and to embrace and have deep conversations and connect with people. I love the moment that breaks your heart. I love the tough part in the scene where everybody else runs from that moment. I was the guy they gave those moments to or gave things in short notice. You'll notice from the Connors in particular, I got the most work usually on our live episodes because it was like, got to go, got to go right now and can't make mistakes. And it's in real time. Who's ready and who wants to be in the game? I love being in the game. Being in the game is always better than coaching in the booth. Well, and you're also a writer. You've done a lot of writing. And when I think of what drives your creativity as a writer, it seems to me that when you look at the TV shows and movies out there, I often feel that there's a message and a tone that just isn't being conveyed very well in terms of social issues that really matter in society. I'm talking like blue collar issues, fatherhood, multiracial families, foster care system, which is terribly broken, by the way the opioid addiction epidemic, suicide, all of the things that people live with all the time really aren't out there. And something tells me between your writing talent, the pain you've lived with in your own life that you've somehow harnessed into creativity, you're going to be the one to choose the projects that are going to make a difference. I just know it. Well, those are all in my wheelhouse, Harvey. What I'll tell you is I have taken my heartbreak and my heartache and I pour it into things. And I don't write projects just for me, I write projects and that's what it's about. It's about telling real stories. It's about connecting people. And my life's been touched by more 
tragedy and suicide and death and loss. And if you can't find the beauty and the heart and the love in that, then you will absolutely fall apart. And I think that's what every great hero's journey is. I, I would tell you, my life's been this beautiful journey of challenges and blessings. And I've worked a lot of blue collar jobs. I've worked a lot of tough places. I have a pretty good perspective because I didn't, it's the greatest gift, not getting rich, was the opportunity to never be so comfortable that I didn't have to hustle and I didn't have to scrap and that I didn't lose touch with what most people are experiencing. So yeah, this is, you know, this is my, my real world is empowering my writing. I'm sure you know more than most people that show business is first and foremost a business. How do you strike a balance between treating what you do as a business, but at the same time, not losing sight of creating that magic that we all want to see on the screen? Well, I don't think I've ever really worked on a project that wasn't successful. And it's not because I'm so brilliant or because I pick them perfect. It's because it's a will thing, right? It's the willingness because that's what life really is. Every project you have to will into existence. And I think that's part of this is, are you willing to roll up your sleeves and do the work and do the hard things? Because success comes from consistency over time. Success comes from your willingness to dive in and go deep. And it's a business. It absolutely is. But a great story will always win. And good people, if they're being authentic, will always find connection with others. Well, you just summed it up. Michael, I want to take a moment and express my heartfelt condolences to you and your family on the sudden passing of your dear son, Larry, in 2020. How are you and your children doing, Michael? You know, it's funny. <laughs> every time I think I'm ready for this question, just the mention of his name gets me every time. So I guess that'll tell you truthfully and honestly how I'm doing. Uh, how I'm doing is he's motivated me. My kids are beautiful. They're amazing. They teach me more and more every single day. And he taught me in the very limited time I got to be in his life. He was an incredible blessing and taught me incredible lessons and motivated me in a lot of different ways. And it is my job, much like I feel like it's my job with Glenn Quinn and a number of other people from my life, to make sure I carry on their legacy and their memory and that I honor it well. And one of the best ways I can is to tell stories that help others understand or experience things that they experienced or prevent others from having to experience some of that pain. Well, a lot of people may not know that you started taking care of your little brother when he was nine years old, and then you became a father at 18 and again at 21, and then you adopted three more children well, maybe they weren't all legally adopted, but to me, you're their father. Now, most people don't feel ready to have kids so young. But in your case, Michael, I'm wondering if being around adults so much as a kid while you were working, did that give you an advantage that other kids don't have? I think it gave me some advantages. I think I also I worked with a lot of people who didn't know how to be parents. And I watched some of that pain. And what I'll tell you is, for me, I have five kids. I also have Jaden Ray and Jonah Ray. Jaden played my daughter on the show. Those kids that come into my life, I, going back to that moment where I was all by myself and had no one to turn to, there's a thing to me about kids. If you come into a kid's life, that's a one-way decision. And so for me, I have been dedicated in a way because I both know what it's like to be the kid who needed people and to be the one who had no one to turn to. And so my children will never know that. And it doesn't matter whether it's a legal adoption, doesn't matter whether it's, you know, from the court. I make a one way commitment. If I come into a child's life, it is a lifetime commitment on my half. And I don't expect I don't expect for it to be even or reciprocal. I expect for me to give and for them to grow. And I think that's part of the problem with parenting is people have kids now a lot of times because they feel something's missing in their life or they think it would be great, and they don't understand that kids are their own people, and it's only our job to guide them and help them build, and that they're going to push you and test you. They're going to reflect back your best and your worst, and they are going to make sure that you understand that you messed up at times. 
and my children, whew, they remind me all the time when I mess up and I, I think it's been a great humbling lesson. I never thought I'd be a dad at, eight, at 18. I thought I'd be 45 or 50. I thought I, everybody who knew me when I was young thought I was closer to be on the George Clooney path. And what I would say is it's the most beautiful gift that's ever happened to me. And it probably, it definitely made me a much better man and maybe saved me from the monster I could have been had I not had any of that responsibility because it required me to really focus outside of myself. What a blessing. What a blessing you are, Michael. You've been a very strong advocate for inclusivity and for fighting racism and bigotry. And as a father of children of color, this is a very personal issue for you, as it should be for all of us. Do you see a special or unique role for artists such as yourself in combating racism? Yeah, I think, you know, we have people's ear in a unique way. I think art can touch people in ways that maybe conversation or their community right around them hasn't been able to. You know, I look going all the way back to Jackie Robinson, right? Jackie Robinson was even before Martin Luther King Jr. And what I'll say about that is sports was entertainment. It was a place where people had not considered breaking barriers. And all of a sudden they saw someone who was not just good, but was great, but withstood all these things. And when I think it's unfortunate that through history, people have to endure horrible mistreatment and injustice for others to realize the injustice that's being you know perpetrated because a lot of people have the privilege of not seeing it and i'm a i'm a believer that people are people you know I, I, i'm it's hard because for me race is not the central way that i look at the world but i'll tell you as a dad i watch the way it impacts my children and I watch the way it impacts our family and the way people perceive it. And it is life changing. And so I've grown a lot over the last 10 years in particular in that area, because I just thought we were further along than we are. And so it's my job to kind of, I don't want to force it on anybody. I don't want to force it down anybody's throat. I'm not here to push my agenda, but I believe that people at their core have the same goals and wants and needs. And the minute we stop looking at each other's colors of their skin, or their orientation, or their outward projection, or what you think is different about them. The moment you do that, you realize that at our core, we all mostly want the same things. And that's a human being with the same kind of heart that's beating inside of you. You're a very private person, Michael, but you do make yourself visible on social media. As a celebrity, what do you consider to be a positive objective of having a social media platform? Well, I used to be a lot more private. I'll be honest, you know, losing my son forced me not to be and started with a conversation I had with my daughter, his older sister. Because I said, I don't, people are asking me, I don't know what to say. And she said, tell the truth. And if we can help one other family not experience what we're experiencing, then it's all worth it. And I became much more public because up until that point, I had never posted pictures of my kids and with little kids. I, I still think that's a good policy if you have fame. I try for my social media not to be a highlight reel because I think it's easy as a celebrity. I get to do great things. I go to events. You know, I, I'm, you know, here at these huge moments. I'm on sets. I'm surrounded by famous people. That's not realistic for most people. I think it's important that we show that we struggle too, because everybody wants to present this perfect life and people are trying to compete with that. And I, I'll tell you my secret for surviving fame and success and, and that my whole life is I never created a persona. I accepted that I'm human and I'm flawed. And instead of trying to hide behind this version that I wanted the world to see and then having to try to keep it up, I've just chosen to be more authentic and be honest with people and say, this is who I am. I'm learning on the process. If I'm wrong, show me and teach me. And that has worked. <laughs> for some, for some, I would say, honestly, I'm not for everybody. And I think that's the other part people have to realize is not everybody's going to love what you do. There's our people who are angry or hateful and they're going to come looking for somebody. And I kind of welcome that at times. I probably use social media in a way that other people don't because 
I remember when we first came back to Roseanne, there was a lot of hate regarding DJ, his character. And I remember talking to Jaden Ray's mom and saying, you know, what kind of messages is Jaden getting? Or what kind of messages are you guys getting? She said, so far it's been okay. I said, great. Then let me get all the nasty, like, whatever. And if, if there's something, let me stand in front and let me stand by her side. But let me stand in front and take some of that. Because a child shouldn't endure that. And I know because some of that I endured. And I will tell you, if you can if you make life easier for people, that's my subtle goal in everything. I want to tell you something. When I was doing my research for this interview, I discovered almost immediately that you have a reputation for being the nicest, kindest person in Hollywood. Did you know that? I, I like the word kind. I don't love the word, the word nice, I think, because nice people take advantage of or underestimate. Kind is a choice. And here's what I'll tell you, Harvey. I love people and I love what we do. And it's my job to come into a set and make it a better, brighter place. And kindness is easy and it's free. And I think small act of kindness changed the world. Well, I have to tell you, Michael, it's been such a pleasure meeting you. I really appreciate you, not only for your talent as an actor, writer, director, producer, but for the way you're living your life, your commitment to your children and to your community, your determination to remain sincere and authentic and real. And I'm so grateful that you took the time to appear on our show. Thank you. Harvey, this was wonderful. And I love how in-depth you went and how you always research everyone. You do a tremendous job of touching people, not just what they do, but who they are. And it's very appreciated. Well, that means the world to me. Thank you so, so very much. And you know you are welcome to come back on our show anytime. Well, let me do some big things so that you have great things to talk about. But let me come back and share them. It would be my pleasure. Thank you so much. Our guest has been actor, writer, director, and producer Michael Fishman. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.